So in this video, I'm going to be talking about the difference between analytical and numerical solutions, and this is specifically in the context of ordinary differential equations. Once I've done that, I'm going to move on to talking in a bit more detail about numerical solution techniques and how the different ones uh, differ from each other. So we'll start off by talking about analytical methods for solving um, ordinary differential equations. And there's a few different techniques that um, you'd probably be familiar with if you've watched the previous videos I've done. So for solving first order differential equations, um, we can use integrating factors or separation of variables. And for solving second order differential equations, um, one of the techniques is to look at the roots of the characteristic equation um, and then use a guessing table. However, um, for all of these different techniques, um, what we require is that differential equation needs to be able to be written in the form uh, where we can apply that technique. So for example, with separation of variables, we need to be able to write all of the variables, say, with y in them on one side of the equation, and all of the variables with, say, t in them on the other side of the equation. And if that's not possible, then we're not able to use this technique. Um, similarly for this one here, where we use the roots of the characteristic equation, um, we require that um, the equation have linear coefficients on it. Again, if that doesn't happen, then we aren't able to use this technique. Okay, so all these um, analytical solution methods are only applicable to certain um, differential equations. I'll put ODEs. However, if we are able to uh, use these techniques, what we are able to get out is an exact solution, okay? And that's provided in the form of an equation, so y is a function of time, and we can use the equation to directly calculate the value of the function, so y, at any point of interest t, okay? And it's always gonna be a perfect um, exact solution to that equation. So let's pretend this is t and this is y. All right, and we're able to plot the exact solution as being something like this. All right, so let's move on now to numerical methods for solving differential equations. So there's a few different ways we can do it. Um, I've listed three out here. So this is pronounced Euler, so Euler's method, modified Euler's method, and the runge cutter method, RK4. So the key here is that numerical solutions can be applied to any differential equation. So I'll put that here, applicable to any ODE. So it doesn't matter what the differential equation looks like and whether it can be written in a form um, appropriate for this. Um, no matter what, you're going to be able to solve the differential equation using a numerical method. And in fact, there are differential equations that exist um, where there are no known analytical solutions to them. Um, I think a classic example of that is the Navier-Stokes equation, if you want to have a Google um, of what that one's all about. Um, but that's to do with how fluids move over time, and there is no, yeah, no known analytical solution for that equation. So what that means is you're forced into using a numerical method. So numerical solutions um, are able to give us an approximation uh, for the value of the function at any point of interest t. And you can obtain the approximation by starting at t equals zero. So this corresponds to your initial condition uh, that you'll need to be given. And then what you can do is estimate the next point in the sequence, so at a future time, which we're calling t plus h, um, and we can do this over and over and over again. So one of the important things um, in this approximation um, is the step distance, which is the h that we can see here. So this distance is going to impact significantly upon the accuracy of the solution. Um, similarly, the numerical method that you select, so these are the three I've given, um, that also impacts upon the accuracy of your solution. So as an example, um, let's uh, plot what a numerical um, method solution might look like on this graph. So we've been given our initial condition, which tells us what's happening at t equals zero. So you'd hope that you'd get kind of the exact uh, value at that point since it was given to you. So this is at time equals zero. So what's going to happen is you're going to take a step distance, which is h, okay, and we kind of add it onto the previous time point. So if this is zero, the next point would be h, because that's zero plus h. 
And then what we do is we use the previous point as well as um, an approximation for the gradient, and that depends on uh, which of these uh, methods you're using, in order to predict what the next point in um, the sequence is. So for example, you might guess it's up here. Okay, we then repeat this process. So we add on another h to it. So this would take us to say 2h. And again, we would use the previous point and an uh, estimate for the gradient, all right? Again, that depends on which method you pick here in order to estimate where this next point is. So we might go, oh, okay, we guess it's here. And we'd keep going as far into time as we're interested in. So it might be 3h then, we get a point here. 4h, um, based on the previous, we get it to be here, okay? And if we join all of these points together, that is our approximation uh, for what the uh, solution to the differential equation actually is. Now you can imagine that if you take very big um, step distances, what you're going to end up is with large deviations from the actual solution. Okay, so picking a step distance h is kind of a balance between um, getting a accurate solution um, and but also one that is not um, terribly um, slow to obtain. Okay, because if you have lots and lots and lots of points that you need to calculate y at, it's going to take a very long time in order to predict what's happening way out in the future. So it's important to remember that when we're doing these numerical solutions, um, we're always building them from the beginning of time, t equals zero, out until whatever time um, you're interested in, in stopping at, okay? You can't just rock up and say, okay, I want what's happening at time equals three seconds, for example, all right? You're not gonna be able to just get it out, okay? You've gotta predict all the way back from the beginning up until that point. If you compare that though to the analytical solution, since you've got this red line that describes everything that's happening to y over time, you could just substitute, say your time equals three seconds into the equation and just get out what's happening at that um, one particular point. So that's the kind of difference between employing an analytical method versus employing a numerical method. So the next thing I'm gonna talk through is the difference between these three numerical methods um, that I've got. And I've alluded to the fact that these are gonna control kind of how we calculate uh, the gradient um, that we use to estimate where these uh, future points actually lie in our sequence. So if I scroll down, so if I scroll down, what we can see is that we're gonna apply our numerical methods to a first order uh, system. Okay, so dy dt, which you can alternately write as y dash of t, is going to be a function of both the time and the y value at that particular point in time. So if you have a higher order system, so second, third, and so on, remember that you can rewrite it as a system of first order equations. And this is what you need to do if you're going to apply your numerical solutions um, to it. But for now, what we're going to focus on is just having a single first order differential equation that we're going to solve using the different uh, numerical techniques. So if we look at the first one here, we've got Euler's method. And Euler's method relies on the gradient at a point t to, in order to estimate the next value in the sequence, okay, y at t plus h. So if I draw myself a little diagram of to visualize, I guess, how this might look. So remember that we're always given our initial condition. So that's gonna be what's happening at t is equal to zero. And what we can see um, the equation is doing is for the next point in the sequence, so t plus h, so zero plus h leaves us with h. We're gonna make it approximately equal to what we started with, okay? So it's gonna be this point here, plus h, which is our step distance, multiplied by the gradient at what was happening at the previous point, okay? So this gradient here, all right, comes from your differential equation. So as an example, if you had that uh, y dash of t was equal to, I don't know, 3t plus 4y, okay, you would be able to calculate um, what was happening um, in terms of the gradient um, because you know at t equals zero, okay, what the y value actually is. So say we did that, and let's pretend that the gradient at this point looks something like this, okay? 
So what we're basically doing is projecting this gradient into the future, all right, in order to estimate what's happening at H. Okay, so if we dot this up, it's basically going to be where the intersection occurs. And that's going to be our next Y value, all right, in the sequence. So now we can kind of repeat this process once again. So the next point in the sequence at T plus H, so it's going to be H plus H, which is 2H, is equal to what was happening at the previous point, all right, so this one here, plus again we're going to take H and multiply it by uh, the gradient at this previous point. So again, we should be able to go back and calculate the gradient, right? We have our equation. We know the T value, all right, at the previous point is this H1, and we know the Y value, at least our approximation of it from before. So what that means is we can go through and calculate the gradient at this point, all right? Let me use a different color. Let's say this one here. And let's say that we've figured out this is the gradient um, at point H. So now all we've got to do is kind of project this outwards to the next point in time and we end up with this for our approximation. So if we join these all together and we could keep going for as many time points as we were interested in, um, we would have an approximation for what y looked like um, over time t. So that's all the Euler's method is doing. So let's move on now to the next method which is the modified Euler's method. So this one is going to use the gradient at t and at t plus h and it's going to average them in order to estimate the next point in the sequence. Okay, so by virtue of the fact that we're using two gradients and averaging them across the domain, what we should find is that this method is more accurate. Okay, so I'll pop in here increased accuracy. But you can imagine it takes a little bit more effort then um, to calculate two gradients in order to estimate the next point, rather than up here we only had to calculate one. So this one is more computationally um, intensive. So let's draw ourselves a diagram again of what's um, happening in this modified Euler's method to kind of visualize what we've got. So again, we've been given our um, value at t is equal to zero. And what we want to do is estimate the next point in the sequence. Okay, so t of, sorry, y of t plus h. So we're adding on our step distance, which will take us to h. So it's going to be equal to whatever we had at the previous point, so this one here, plus h on 2 um, multiplied by, this is the gradient at the previous point, okay, so the gradient at this point here, plus the gradient at the next point in time, so the t plus h point, okay. So you can see that this divided by 2 is the average of the gradient across that um, domain that we're interested in. So we should be able to work out the um, gradient at our previous point, okay? It's going to be the same as what we had before, the same y dash of t. The um, second gradient, y dash of t plus h, is a little bit more tricky, okay? That's because you can see up here in the equation, it depends on the t and the y value at that particular point in time. But this is kind of unknown at the moment. That's what we're trying to estimate, okay? So t plus h, uh, sorry, y of t plus h, and y of t plus h is required on both sides of the equation. And this is what we want to get out, but it's kind of circularly dependent. So how we're going to get around this is I'm going to introduce y hat, right, which is equal to this little bit in here. And we're going to basically use the Euler's method in order to estimate it. So we take the previous point plus h times, this is again the gradient um, based on the previous point. Okay, so it's just using the Euler's method to get an estimate um, for the y value at the next point in the sequence. So essentially what we're doing then is we're going to have the gradient at this point here. Let's pretend it looks like this. And we're going to have the gradient that is calculated at the um, h point in our sequence. All right, let's pretend that it looks like, I'll draw it up here, a flat line. So what we're doing is taking the average of both of these. So I would guess the average, I'm going to draw it through this point here. It's kind of like this. All right, and then we're using the previous point um, and projecting that average gradient across in order to get our new estimate for what's happening at H, okay? So now we can um, basically repeat the process as many times as we want. So the next point in our sequence, y of t plus h, adding on an extra h, so 2h. So we get it by knowing the gradient at this particular point, which we can uh, recalculate. All right, so it again looks something like this. 
and at this new point we calculate say it looks something like this and we take the average of the two and let's say it's like that so projecting across to this new point we end up here so our solution looks something like this and you can continue obviously as much as you need all right so one left and that's the runge cutter method um, abbreviated to rk4 so this one I'm not going to go into as much detail on, um, but basically what happens is you've got weighted gradients across the interval, um, so between uh, t and t plus h, and this is used to estimate um, the next uh, point in the sequence, uh, t plus h. So you can see here the next point is approximated from the previous one as before, and then it's weighted uh, 1 on 6, and you can see that we've got k1, k2, k3, and k4 constants appearing in the equation. And these are calculated using these formulas here. But basically what's happening is the K2 and the K3 uh, values are getting higher weighting because they have twos on them compared to the one and the four uh, constants. And basically what that means is if we jump back up to this kind of diagram, if we're looking at what's happening between um, T and T plus H, uh, the gradient at the beginning and the end of that interval which kind of corresponds to the K1 and the K4, um, they're getting a lower rating or weighting compared to what's happening in the middle. So the gradients in the middle here kind of correspond to the K2 and the K3. So basically, it's just another way of trying to get a better estimate um, in order to predict the gradient that we need to project across uh, for that next point in the sequence. So you can see that again we've got a few more calculations that um, have to happen and this is because again moving from the previous to the next um, method here you're going to see some increased accuracy um, just from all those extra calculations you get a better estimate for the gradient to project. So that's pretty much all there is um, in terms of this video. So I'll have a couple of examples applying these numerical techniques onto actual differential equations for solutions. Otherwise I'll see you in those videos.